information about this word. I told you many times, the Lord is a He's not uh, like uh, the Muslims see Allah as being a prankster, but he does set you up a lot of times. And uh, a lot of times the more I prepare, just before I get up to speak, he says, that was great, now do this instead. So I was glad to hear the confirmation. First of all, the worship. Can you put those words up for me, Billy? I'll wait till you get back there. The worship was so anointed, wasn't it? I mean, it was so anointed that I was looking at one of the choruses. I asked Billy if he'd put that up because I wanted to say something about it. And it'll come up there in a minute. But, you know, we are living in strange times, aren't we? Yeah. So look at this graves in the garden. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. <laughs> What's the next one? The second the second. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. I want to proclaim that today. There is no other God. Amen. The gods of the nations are what? Idols. But the Lord has made the heavens. Amen. We have forgotten that. One of the other songs talked about revival. You know revival, we think of revival. People go into a tent and get saved. No, that's not it. It's bringing to life yeah. that which has lost that life. And that is what we need in this country. That is what we need in the Western world. You know, when I lived in China, it was amazing to me. I used to go and visit some of the underground churches. And they were there at the risk of their life. To be in that building that day, they could be hauled out and gone to jail. We used to sneak uh, things into the pastor, Pastor Lim and uh, Shen Zhen. And, no, I'm sorry, he was in... Uh, yeah, I don't forget where he was anyway. But uh, we used to go in there and have to sneak in things. Because if he got caught with him, they'd take him away and they'd haul him off and lock him up. He built a church, uh, had a church meeting in a house that was given to him by his grandfather. And uh, him and his wife suffered tremendously. But they would come and just grab all the things that the Westerners dropped off. Tracks, Bibles, tapes. Take them and lock him up. And then they'd let him out in six months, and he'd go right back to the same place and do the same thing. We have lost that fervor. It's amazing that in a place where, uh, where the hardest persecution comes at the drop of a hat, that's where you'll find the deepest worship. So you know there's a price to pay. I want to read something to you. Some of you probably have heard of this. I did not till last week. I knew part of it. But probe ministries out of um, the West Coast somewhere. I forget uh, where they are. Kirby Anderson's a guy I've heard on the radio a lot. They did a survey last year, and here's what it is. According to a new survey, born-again Christians have experienced a startling de degradation in their biblical beliefs during the past decade. The survey, which included more than 3,000 Americans between 18 and 55, reveals that born-again Protestants experienced the greatest level of decline in Bible-based beliefs from 2010 to 2020. During that decade, the percentage of people who agreed with core Christian doctrines fell from 47% to 25%. That's powerful, isn't it? Ten years. Although people may label themselves as born-again Christians, says Anderson, they still can have a false view of Jesus Christ and embrace a pluralistic worldview. The drop in Bible-based beliefs among young adults from 15% to 5%. Only 5% of young adults believe in a biblical worldview. It's remarkable and devastating. Among U.S. born-again Christians between 18 and 39, more than 60% say there's more than one way to salvation access. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 60% say there's more than one way to salvation, including Buddha and Mohammed and Jesus. More than 30% say Jesus sinned while living in the earth. Or others said they didn't know for sure. In addition to exploring basic biblical worldviews, the survey also asked 
participants about expanded biblical views, including whether the devil is real or symbolic. The drop-off in categories is both and dramatic. And it's the, you know, it's the old Keith Green song. The devil, some of his best work is getting you not to believe in him. It's a good thing about the old revival guys. I used to love Oliver B. Green, man. He was the old hardcore guy, you know, and he goes, love it, love it, love it. But he closed every message with, God save the sinner, nearest hell. Man, I'll tell you what, you got to appreciate those guys. Now, here's, here's the thing. This is happening in America. In America, where most people believe we are the benchmark of Christianity in the world. We are the ones who live and believe in the Bible more than anybody. But now here's the interesting thing that's happening right now in communist China. China's <laughs> government banned effeminate men on TV and told broadcasters last Thursday to promote revolutionary culture, brought in a campaign to tighten control over business and society, and enforce official morality. Now think about this. The Communist Party, President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping, has called for a national rejuvenation with tighter Communist Party control of business, education, culture, and religion. Companies and the public are under increasing pressure to align with this vision. So what is it? What are they doing about this? First of all, they're doing away with sissy men, what they call sissy men, in the media. They don't want to see Koreans and Japanese. They've got all these pop singers and actors who are... <laughs> no more, they said. And they're going to happen here. Sissy men. The, the, I, I like the, uh, having lived there for a while, I love the Chinese word, ning pia, ning pao. And what that means is girly guns. No more. They don't want actors. They don't want highlighted singers. They don't want pop stars to be idolized. They want them done with it. They're not going to be on TV. So here we are in America going down the tubes. And communism is trying to grab a hold of some sense of real, normal, cultural morality. Because it's not abnormal. Aberrant behavior is abnormal. And we are endorsing it and promoting it in this country. Right now, if I said that in a Canadian church, and I said something against the things that are happening, like the fact that we have transvestites now going to public libraries where their parents can bring the kids in so they can do their act and tell people how good it could be to be a transvestite. If you think you're a girl, maybe you are. Who cares if your name is Jose? It doesn't matter. But if I said that in Canada right now, they could take away whatever Canadian version of a 501c3 would be in my church. They would take away my uh, tax exemption. They would maybe even arrest me if I was to say that there's some young man who decided he was a girl, that your real name's Peter, not Susie, I could be arrested. So in the Western world, we're going crazy with aberrant liberality. Yet in communist China, where they really know how to persecute there, they're waking up and saying, wait a minute, this is not our way. We don't want to be like the sissified by Koreans or the sis by Japanese. Because why? Because they say they are taking away the masculinity of the men and the boys. Boy, that sounds familiar to things I've thought when I see what's on American television, when I see what's on American pop world. They're actually telling the Chinese people, quit idolizing famous people. Well, Jesus said, Beware when all men say good things about you, speak well of you. Beware of the deception of riches and fame. This is a Christian theme. We're losing it, and they're gaining it. I'm not saying, well, actually, to tell you the truth, let me say something I don't think I've ever said here before. The root of communism is the book of Acts without God and without love. That's what communism claims to be doing. From each who have too much to each who have too little. If you've got too much, we'll take it away and give it to those who have too little. That's a socialist mantra. That came out of Corinthians. But Marx was a backslidden Christian who ended up hating God. And so he stole the principles but took the source out of it. God, like the song says, 
You are the only one that can do that. When you look at the book of Genesis, you see what God did. What he made from the dust. You know, scientists have now discovered that the human body has all the exact same ingredients as dust. Gee, took them a long time to figure that out. All they needed to do was read Genesis. <laughs> from the dust you came, from the dust you returned. He made Adam from dust. David really used to say, we're just a dirty bag of old dust in, in essence. Well, the reality of it is God glorified that. Oh, by the way, Bill, that was the best communion message I've ever heard in my life. That was anointed, brother. That's why I say everything was anointed today. Don't you think that was anointed? Did you want all that stuff? But I mean, the anointing was on it, brother. That's great. Being set apart to do something special like that. I think you're called to preach. <laughs> so, I want to say a couple of things before I minister out of the Matthew 22. We're living in a strange time. We glorify the aberrant behavior. And we're making it so that if you don't do it, you're going to be in trouble. If you try to tell a little nine-year-old kid in school, or even that little six-year-old kid in school, that he is not really the girl he thinks he is, you can be in trouble. What a crazy time. Whoever thought we would go that far over the edge? No wonder we need revival. We need our brains to be brought back to normality. Just being normal again would be great. You know, I was thinking about liberty. Years ago, a good friend of mine, Danny Jones, that used to be a pastor at Calvary. I, I, I think he still pastors his church here. Assembly guy. He called me at the coffee house. Hey, I want to take you out to lunch. Really? Never done that before. He said, you want to go? I said, yeah, if we go to the steak, steak out or something like that, I want to, you buy me a steak, <laughs> I'll go home. So we're sitting there, he said, I'm preaching tonight on liberty. And I want to, the, the Lord told me to talk to you about liberty. Okay, and immediately the thought came into my mind, a thought I'd never had before. Liberty is the power of God to live a holy life. That struck me so profoundly. He didn't get it. And I didn't tell him he didn't get it until I was done with my steak. <laughs> but he told me, I don't, I don't get it. That's not what I was thinking God was going to say. But God in, put that into my spirit and it's been with me for these 40 years. But here's what it is. It validates the wisdom of God with free will. Nobody will be in heaven that wouldn't want to be there. People who don't love God here wouldn't love God there because it's going to be all about God. Amen. I mean, when the multitudes are worshiping, they're not sitting around half of them thinking, gee, I wish I could go back to that club I used to hang out with, hang out in and have a few beers. No way. Matter of fact, I was listening to R.C. Sproul. He was doing a teaching on whether or not people in heaven would mourn those who were close to them that did not make it. And he said, no, because we will be so busy and so enthralled with the glory of God, none of that stuff will come to us. It's not going to be about those things. It's going to be about him. It's going to be about him. He is worthy. Because why? Because look at the things he has done that no one else can do. God's got to work, do work for you too. While well, you were up there singing, God told me he's going to elevate your ministry to a whole new level when the two of you are married. I'm excited about that. You feel that anointing coming from these two? More every week, it's like God's doing something. God is doing something. God is doing something. Listen, in Genesis 4.24, it says, Men begin to call on the name of the Lord. Well, you know, I used to look at that and think, well, you know, hey, they were, got booted out of the garden. Now you got uh, Seth and his crowd. And now men are beginning to call upon the name of the Lord. But it doesn't mean they were calling upon the God who is the Lord. And out of that came a lot of the things that eventually caused God, two chapters later, to flood the earth and say, I wish I'd have never made these people. The word God... 
does not necessarily mean the God. You know, the Muslim people say, well, we worship the same God. You cannot do that. Because one of the Quran uh, part, one of the, uh, the verses out of the Quran says, far be it from God's resplendent glory that he should have the Son. Well, the trouble was in 1 John or 2 John, it says, he that hath not the Son hath not the Father. So wait a minute. Both things can't be true. They're opposing ideals, ideas. You can't say God can't have a son and say that Jesus is God. Why? Because he's the son of God. However that works in the Trinity, I can't understand it. I don't need to. God never says understand me. He said follow me. He never said understand me. He said believe. Have faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. He that had hope is hoping for something he can't see. Why would we hope for things we see? We don't. We hope for things we can't see. Why would we hope for things to be like they are now? We don't. We hope for them to be better. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm excited. I'm getting excited. Now, <laughs> let me tell you, I, I know, I know a, young, a lot of young people, thank God they're not all here today. I mean, I wish they were. Hopefully they're over there having some kind of a service. But wherever they are, when I, you remember when I spoke here last year about the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. 2. I believe we're living in that time. The power of the air is electromagnetism. Satan, or one of his dark angels, is the prince of the power of the air. And the power of the air is what this world is all about. Everything in this world. Media, internet, everything that goes on in this today world is under the power of the prince of the power of the air. Because the power of the air is electromagnetism. And that's where all that stuff gets its source. Electromagnetism. So it offends a lot of young people because they're so addicted. But you know the thing I didn't read to you, I wanted to read to you also, I'll just tell you. The Chinese last Wednesday limited anybody eight, under 18 from being on the internet, playing video games for more than three hours a week. That's right. Oh man, there's some screaming, wailing, and crying over there. The teenagers are pulling their teeth out. <laughs> and during the school, they can't do it at all. On a school day, they can't do it at all. Now, gosh, I've said that many times. Maybe I should go over there and sign up with Lee Ping in this group. No, we, we've, we've buried ourselves. I remember when we lived in Hong Kong, when they first came out with these little handheld video games, what do they call them? Uh, you know, I've mentioned this before. Game Boy. Game Boy. I told my wife, okay, half an hour a day, that's the limit. Man, you can't. Half an hour a day? My granddaughter, I had to tell her last night, she was over with my granddaughter Rosie. Honey, turn that thing off. We're eating. This is the time for table talk. <laughs> we should go ahead. <laughs> it's addictive. I'm not saying it's bad. God made the power of the air. It's my wife when she died and went to heaven, as many of you know, she was there for five days. She saw technology. She, she came out of a, a house that she somehow knew was her abode. And she, as she came to the door, a round crystal kind of a, of a, a vehicle pulled up. She got in, and it took off at a million miles an hour, and there were millions of them flying everywhere, not bumping into each other. They all had smiles on their faces. So I don't know. You know, I don't think God would need technology, but maybe he uses it. Who knows? But all I know is today, science has taken the things that God has revealed to us, and they use it to take people away from God. Scientists usually don't end up saying, well, wow, there must be a God. I've got a friend who's a veterinarian. He came to Christ operating on an alligator. <laughs> he cut the alligator open, looked at that thing and said, there must be a God if somebody could make this. He went to the Methodist Church in Kissimmee and got saved. Spent the next 50 years serving God. Amen. Left a vast fortune to serving God, gave a fortune to serving God. That's what God does with revelation. That's what God does when somebody sees that the good things of God are for our benefit to tell us that he's there. 
That if we live for him, we're going to see him. We know not what Jesus is like, but we know that when we see him, we will be like him. Well, is that one of God's promises? Romans 8, 28, uh, uh, all, that uh, uh, all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. We think about Calvinism and that kind of a message there as being about being about being saved. No, it's about the higher life, being conformed to the image of his son. We don't know what he's like, but we know this. When we see him, we're gonna be like him. I can't wait. I'm gonna get my hair back. <laughs> my grandkids look at my pictures in my book, my mules book, with all the hair I had hair down here and, and ringlets, you know, I was born with curly hair. Had ringlets all the way down there. Grandpa, you used to be a hippie. I said, no, I'm not a hippie. I played nightclubs seven nights a week. I work. Hippies don't work. <laughs> I gotta defend myself against these kind of innuendos, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, so turn to Matthew chapter 22, if you would. I got my watch here. All right. <laughs> See, I was going to go like this. I said, don't make it easier to go like this. <laughs> Verse 1, And Jesus answered and spake unto them. By the way, this is a, just a short while before he went on and died on the cross. You know, I met our new brother. Came into the church, got saved in prison. One thing that helped me, Frank Constantino used to say, the first guy to heaven was a death row inmate that Jesus met on Friday night. Wow. You ever think about that? Wow. <laughs> it's a heavy statement, isn't it? I said to him when I came in the door, I said, Greg, you and me, we're not ex-anything. We're not ex-convicts. I got saved in prison. Well, I had to get saved somewhere, and I spent so much time in prison those days. I guess that's where he had to find me. <laughs> I remember when I went to court before I got sentenced. In case some of y'all don't know it, I got saved in prison April 28, 1974, but I went to court with a Sanford judge and I, and uh, for what they call pre-sentence investigation, I just come off and he was getting ready to sentence me. So this company I worked for, the boss and his son, wanted to speak on my behalf. They came in there and said, Bob Gentry, your honor, this man, and we've had, we've got 26 auto parts stores in two states. We've got so many hundreds of employees and this man is the hardest working man we've ever had in our company. The judge says, good, we can use a guy like that in the chain gang. <laughs> they don't always work out the way you think they will do it, right? <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Well, that's it. If you don't know that this is all about Jesus, then you don't know. I'm saying that scientists uh, you know, if, if you track the fact that science generally, it means gnosis, gnosis is knowledge. That's what science is, knowledge. They ought to be a little leery because everything bad happened when somebody went and chewed on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge, by knowledge men know not God. We know God by revelation. Unless God reveals himself to us, we cannot know God. Where would you look for God if he didn't reveal himself to you? He hides. He's like a lover. Come and find me. Come and find me. I'm going to do things that are going to draw you to me. No man can come to me except the Holy Spirit. That the Father sends out to get me is going to draw me to him. Sometimes he has to empty us of ourselves before we'll come. Sometimes he has to fill us before we'll come. But nobody will come to Jesus except the Father draws him. And so we shouldn't be afraid about the various ways that God brings us to Jesus. But Jesus is only going to take us to the real God. <laughs> He's going to take us to himself. Isaiah said, he should be called the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Who can understand that? I can't understand it. God didn't tell me I had to. He just said, believe it. 
Live for it. Live for this reality that God so loved me that he sent his only begotten son to find me when I was lost. People used to say to me when I got out of prison, did you find Jesus? I said, no, he found me. He wasn't lost. I was lost. <laughs> you find religion? No. No, religion is man's search for God. God's not lost. <laughs> man's lost. He's searching for us. They used to talk, call it the hound of heaven. They used to call it the Holy Spirit. Remember that bill, the hound of heaven. God said, not the hound of heaven to hunt us down. Man, I'll tell you what, that hound was all over the place for me too. I was really lost. Okay, he set forth his servants. Now I want to say this. When I first got baptized in the Holy Spirit, when I got out of prison, God led me to a group of people. And a man named Mike Kelly, he's dead now, but he was a, a 1969 MVP in the Gator Bowl, played the hula bowl with Bill uh, with Plunkett. And uh, he was a great star from the University of Florida. He laid hands on me and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, God brought me there. But back in those days, we were all new, all of us, you know, a bunch of us guys, most of the people there uh, weren't that far from smoking dope doing stuff like that. They were new in the Lord. It was a Calvary cell group that, and back in those days, what the cell group would do was they would get instructions about what Pastor Harley was going to preach on. So they would prepare them. And then when everybody got, you know, young Christians, you see, you're so amazed by everything. We got to Sunday and heard him preach. Wow, well, that's, that's exactly what we were talking about in our home group. Man, that's incredible. It well we set up to get you to think about it, you know. That's a smart pastor there. <laughs> pastor Harley used to say, whatever you see the word in the Bible there for, you're supposed to ask yourself, what's it there for? <laughs> I love stuff like that. He came up great term, sloppy, agape, you know. When you're a new guy that just lived, I was 28 when I got out of prison, and just living in that kind of a life. You hear terms like that, agape, what's that, sloppy agape, what's that, that's kind of cool, you know. <laughs> good stuff, preachers can do stuff good every now and then. So anyway, but what we used to realize back then, that Paul talked about being a servant and a bond servant. For me to live as Christ, for me to live as Christ. Can you think of anything else that fits in that sentence? For me to live as family. No, it's important, but it ain't enough. For me to live as my career? No. Thank God for it. But it ain't enough. The only thing that we were created to completely be fulfilled with is Christ. Amen. For me to live is Christ. And if I live for Christ, I'll do the right thing with my family. I often feel guilty because I was so guilty because I was so hard. The life I brought my family into, I just share with our brother and sister uh, who are missionaries. Is the, I share with them. When we moved to Hong Kong, my youngest son was three months old. We didn't have a clue. We didn't know anybody over there. We landed in the Hong Kong airport at one o'clock. My oldest kid was eight, my next was seven, next was six, and then the three month old. We landed in the airport at one o'clock, had all these things. They looked at us and said, oh my God, just went through, they can't be that evil with that many kids, you know? <laughs> so we rented a room at the YWCA. And later, God led me to a place where we rented a place. But I mean, why would I do that? Because I believed I was a servant of God. And whatever God says, I'm to do it. I'm not to ask questions. If, if I can respond to the generals of the army or the admirals of the navy with total authority, why not God? Well, you know, a lot of times I'm hard on myself about that. But my oldest son said to me something the other day, really touched me. They had a good feeling that way. None of your kids are doing drugs. None of your kids have walked off and done crazy things. Okay, it wasn't an easy life, but we're walking with the Lord. We're all doing good in our, in our jobs. We all love Jesus. So, I mean, you gotta look at things differently when you feel that God means business when he says, when he calls his ministers servants. He's made them a flame of fire, the Bible said. Do you ever feel like that, brother? Feel like Jeremiah? I feel like fire. Shut up in my bones. I can't stop. I cannot tell people. I cannot tell that woman at the toll booth, 
Jesus loves you. Would you like to change? After I lead you to the Lord, you know, you can't stop because we're servants. What God wants of us, and he called us servants, this guy did. That's who God calls. We're looking for a revival of servants. Christianity is not a career. It's a life. You can make it a career if you want to. It ain't nothing bad with that, if you, I guess. I mean, but they can fire you. If they don't like what you're preaching. I remember Max Jones, a friend of mine was a chaplain up at Death Row for years. He used to tell the guys. <laughs> and they come into the, we'd be out there every third Sunday and having meetings. And Mark Surf was there at the time. A lot of the guys were there. Were killers. You know, Larry Reese, a good friend of mine that's out now. He loves the Lord. Uh, he watched the movie back in the 1960s. And the movie was where some guy walked into a gas station and Blew the guy away with a shotgun. So he went out and did it. Ended up getting a life. He's out now. He's been out for about 15 years. Loves the Lord. Just sent me a thing yesterday of the church he's involved in up in Jacksonville. Murph the Surf died in January. Uh, his movie's coming out this January. Exciting. But that guy, he loved God. I met Murph when we were in prison. He just got saved. But Murphy was not a God lover. But once he got saved, man, that guy probably, probably led a million people to the Lord in prisons. Wow. I'm telling you, I believe that. His whole life was devoted to Jesus Christ. I remember we were doing a funeral for a friend of ours that I led to the Lord down in Okeechobee. Uh, we were down, I led him to the Lord when he was in prison, but we were doing a funeral down in Okeechobee. Murphy and I, one of our things is people that we do always ask us to come and play violin or sing at their funerals, you know. Murph was a great violinist, and uh, we get up there. And we're at this funeral doing it, and and after the uh, after the uh, they showed this slide presentation where Rico, the guy who died, he was just tears and all the people crying out there. Well, Murphy and I, we had a little monitor in front of us. All we could see was Murphy or was Rico's face, mm -hmm. you know. So they're all crying. So anyway, after after that, after the slide presentation, Rico's wife got up. So now don't forget, Rico's life was spared for another twenty years because he had a liver transplant. So make sure you all become donors. Well, here we are among 300 ex-drug addicts. I couldn't pass it up. I grabbed the mic. I said, I'm not, I'll tell you this, but you can sell every liver on this room, in this room on eBay for $35. <laughs> I can see the doctors now. No thanks, but we just have liver. So but Murphy, <laughs> Murphy was a great servant of God. So God calls his servants. And it doesn't mean you have to get recognized by anybody else. You have to settle in your heart. If God's called me, I will serve him. And where he sends you, what he does with you is up to him. And sometimes the things you think he should have done, and maybe I missed it, are actually the things he did to protect you. Because a lot of the things that come will get you and take you down. If the devil can't take you down with the bad things. He'll take you down with the good things. Jesus said, beware the deceitfulness of riches. What do you mean deceitfulness? Well, take a look at most of the rich people you know. I'm talking about the really rich. How many of them are out there talking about Jesus? Not many. They're building gates and gates and gates and gates to get behind so they don't have to come in touch with the common man. They want to be isolated. Why? Because they think they're special. Well, how did that happen? The deceitfulness of the benefits that life bestowed upon them. I'm not talking about the down on rich people. God bless not. One of the greatest men I ever knew was Jim Goodings. He was one of the most generous people I ever knew. We went to his funeral. Three days that funeral lasted at Calvary Assembly. People got up, oh, Mary, Mary Lee, you probably didn't know this, but Jim sent both our kids to college. That happened over and over and over again. Or somebody get up and say, oh, I remember the storm was so bad, it was raining, we were so broke, my husband just left me. I heard a doorbell ring, and here's Jim Gooding standing there with bags of groceries. Jim was a rich guy, but he dedicated his life to serving God. So he sent forth the servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. This is a history of Israel. This is a history of the world. This is a history of how God separates the sheep from the goats by choice. 
Liberty is the power of God to live a holy life. In other words, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what you can benefit from what you do and what you can lose from what you do, but it's up to you. You have the power to choose this day, Joshua said, who you will serve. You choose. God doesn't squeeze anybody into the kingdom. You make the choice. I made that on April 28, 1974. I was the only one in my row that did. There were 12 other guys with me. I call them the Hittites and the Amalekites. Now they're all 13 of us. Well, when that preacher uh, gave the altar call, I got up. And I went forward. He laid his hands on me and said, Lord, touch this young man and change his life and use him for your glory. And he did. Well, I got a guy out in, uh, out in uh, I think it's Oklahoma. I can't remember where he is. But he wrote me a letter a few years ago, a Facebook post. He found me on Facebook. His name was Pierce, Mike Pierce. But I found out later that was an anonymous. His real name was Russell. He said, I don't know if you know this, but I watched what happened in your life after you got saved that day. And your life changed so much that I ended up breaking out of prison. I got busted on a federal charge. I ended up in a federal prison in Colorado. And I remembered you. And I gave my life to Christ. And now he's an associate pastor in the church out there. Been through a theological seminary. He's got all this stuff now. But you see, God got him another way. From the little things that changed in my life after I said yes to Jesus. God knows how to get us to come to him. God knows how to do that. You don't know who's going to be standing up when you come through the gate and saying, Hey, you remember me? Remember that day you told me on the street that I needed to get saved? Well, I didn't see you again, but I want to tell you, I did. And these 400 million people back here, I led them all to the Lord. So they're on your credit card. <laughs> God is so good to us, but it's up to us if we want that goodness. Okay. How are we doing? Where's my time? I'm doing Oh, man, it's getting close to Gosh. Time goes faster if you have fun. Again, he said, other set servants saying to tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all the things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. In other words, what I do and what I have took me away from the wedding. There are a lot of people that are going to get taken away from the wedding ceremony because of what they do thinking it's more important or what they have thinking it's more important. There is nothing more important than being at that wedding ceremony. Right. They ain't going to be nothing more important. If you're there, you're going to say, Whew. I sure am glad I didn't take them other options. <laughs> I sure didn't like that rules for us, but man, Look at the things here, just like that lady said, they're flying around everywhere. <laughs> no. If God speaks to your heart, no matter what it is, no matter what he wants, no matter what he says, don't choose the other options. The precious things that sin offers us, it'll give us for a while. But the end result is we get dragged into darkness. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully. That's what's happening right now. You hear the mocking about Christians. You hear mocking about, about the belief, those who believe are believers. You know, thank God. We've got, you know, we are so blessed having a governor like DeSantis right now. If you don't recognize the blessing, I guarantee you, he is the next one that's going to file for the abortion law that happened out of Texas. I guarantee you that. Speaking of that, if you wouldn't remember, any judge, any judge is a lady, an older lady. She's in the hospital right now with COVID on a ventilator. She's old. She started and ran a uh, pregnancy center out in Claremont. When we did, when I wrote the play, I never knew. Uh, and a, a poor play about abortion that we did in Claremont. We donated the money to her center. Anyway, her name is Eddie Judge. Please pray for her. She is just a wonderful saint, and she's totally devoted herself to stop the scourge of abortion. So, 
Where was I? And the remnant took their servants and they treated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up the city. Don't think God is not going to judge this world. He is going to judge this world. The judgment of the world is set. God is going to do that. The Son of God is going to come with all of his angels, and he's going to make trouble. There are going to people that say, well, oh, man. You know, I, I remember before I got saved, I used to think, well, as long as I can say Jesus saved me just before I die. I'll be all right. No, you think he's going to let me get away with that? Now, maybe he let some people get away with that who didn't feel that way beforehand. And maybe even, who knows, maybe after somebody dies, they get an opportunity to hear the gospel if they've ever heard it. But I'm glad I heard it the day I heard it. I don't want to be dragged into the kingdom of God. I want to come in standing up so thankful for what he's done to me. My grandson said to me the other day, that what he got with two lawyers at the bottom of the lake? I said, I don't know, Grandpa. I said, I don't know. He said, a good start. So, you know, <laughs> a lot of people don't think lawyers are going to make it. I don't know. <laughs> Morgan and Morgan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, y'all know John Morgan's offered $100,000 to anybody that can write a theme song for Morgan and Morgan. September 26th, if you could write a theme song. That's good. My wife said to me last night, you can work on that theme song. <laughs> I don't know, honey. hundred grand would be nice, though, wouldn't it? That would probably take me down to tubes. I'd probably need a lawyer to get me out of all the trouble a hundred grand would put me into. <laughs> then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go be here forward to the highways, and as many as you should find, bid them merit to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. <laughs> that makes me feel bad. I mean, feel good that he chose the bad and the good. And then he put the bad first on the list. I guess he figured they're going to be the ones we got to get to first. They might not take it. No, God is no respecter of persons. He don't look at us like we look at folks. He don't think, oh, that's a good moral guy there. No, there are none good but God. That's a statement that people don't hear very often. But Jesus said, there are none good but God. So the, the level of good to God means a lot more than it does to us. If a guy treats us nice, you know, I, I, I do sometimes with my grandkids, if, if they give me too much money or something, I try to be a witness to my grandkids. They love to go with me to Publix because, Grandpa, you're the only guy that can go into Publix and before you leave, you know everybody there. Well, that's okay. I like people. People are made in the image of Christ. They all got something to say. They all got something to give. They all got something to be. They all got something to receive. So be there for them, whoever they are. You know? On the other hand, I don't just give it away. I saw a guy on the other street, on the street the other day, had his hand out for money, but his eyes looked like two pee holes in a snowbank. He was bummed out of his head. I said, hey man, go right back to that public. They'll hire you right now. I'm on Social Security, really? Well, then you don't need this $5 I was going to give you. You're stoned. You wanted to buy a six pack, so your buddy over there on the other corner, when it's his turn to come here, you can go there. And drink. Well, I'm not going to give some of that, like that, anything. That'll hurt him. That'll just deepen his darkness. Anyway, coming to the end of this here. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, see, even that guy, he called him friend. God calls us friends. He's not threatened by our badness. He's not threatened by our sin. He's not threatened by our evil. Nothing. You know, the Bible says that God is so perfect that there's no fear in him. How could he fear anything? Because nothing could keep him from being God. <laughs> Nothing can overcome him. You know, the devil tried that. I will sit in the seat of the north. Oh, yeah, watch how far south I kick you with my little finger here. <laughs> You'll sit in the seat of the north. 
<laughs> Sorry, that's reserved for my son. And that is you. God's not afraid of our challenges to him, our, our problems to him. Look at the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. He was a slave trader. But God spent the Holy Spirit out to bring him to him. Oh, man, a slave trader. He influenced the, the thing that stopped slavery in England by his witness in his presence. God. He called him friend. Friend? How come you don't have a garment on? Well, Jesus talked about the garment of praise. Ephesians talks about having our breastplate of righteousness, having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know what that means? Put on the word of God like a pair of shoes and walk in it. Yeah. He told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But except he be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There's a lot of people that see the kingdom of God and they want it, but they don't enter in. In other words, it's like gas in a car. There's a lot of people, you can buy a car and set it in your driveway and never drive it because you're not going nowhere. The baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't about speaking in tongues or, you know, or being the next great uh, Smith Wigglesworth. It's about serving God. It's about putting on the gospel and make sure it's the gospel because I say this with genuine humility in my heart. We gotta be careful. I listened to 20 prophecies from great men. I've been on the Seminary Club twice. I met Pat Robertson three times. He's a good guy, but I also listened to him say, God told me Mitt Romney's gonna be the next president. And he's gonna do two terms. Well, he was wrong. God told me, uh, no doubt, absolutely 100%, Donald Trump is going to win the second election. He was wrong. We got to be careful that we use this here as our source of truth. Amen. This is the word of God. What's missing in this generation is we've forgotten the God of the word and that he was perfectly able to give us his word in a book form. People say, oh, I don't know. I got a, a close people, friends of mine that say, yeah, but the monks, man, they kind of altered it. No, don't you think that the God who could create all things in six days had enough power to make sure this thing came out the way he wanted it to? So that he could say all scripture is given by inspiration of God? He never makes the monks. <laughs> oh, except for that part the monks put in there. Well, we'll just, just work around that part. No, no. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. What's the profit of the boo? To rebuke us, to strengthen us, to prepare us. Why? So that the man of God, and he also means anybody who serves God, will be thoroughly furnished, saturated unto every good work. Oh, God, I love that. I love this guy. He is able to keep all that which I have committed unto him against that day, Paul said. Do you ever worry about going to heaven, Greg? No. You know why? Because you know he's able to keep all that which you gave him that day you gave your heart to Christ in that prison. God is able to keep it. I cannot screw it up. I put it in his hands. I was praying all the way here. I called a few people to ask me to pray. I to ask them to pray this morning. A church over in uh, East Orlando. A bunch of drug addicts open homes. I called them and said, hey, you guys pray for me. I feel like God's giving me this message. But pray that he will confirm it. And then these guys came up here saying everything that I needed. And then Bill gave a message, everything that I needed to confirm this is what he wanted me to say. So if you guys don't like it, don't blame me. Blame God. <laughs> <laughs> now, the last thing I want you to say here. That said, the king to the servants, bind him, the guy that didn't have the garment. All you need is the garment, the garment of praise, the garment of Jesus Christ. You don't need anything else. Your good works mean nothing in heaven. My good works mean nothing. In, I preach a lot of messages. They have no meaning in heaven when I get there. All he wants to know is, what do you think about my son? Isn't he something? 
He's something else, isn't it? Well, yeah, he's you. I know it. Isn't that cool? Did you ever figure that one out? No, I never could. Doesn't matter. What matters is, have you put on Christ like a garment? Is he on you like a garment? Do you wear him where you go? So that people can experience him through you. That's why I left you on the earth. I could have taken you home that day that you gave your heart on April 28, 1974. But I didn't. Why? I wanted to leave you here. So you can wear the garment of my son. So that that guy that didn't go all forth in the altar that day, years later I could find him in a federal prison cell and remind him that you changed. He was out there wearing a new cloak. So here's what he said in this last part. For many are called and few are chosen. It's interesting. We get stuck in denominational thinking. We shouldn't. God is multidimensional. Many are called. You know what that means? Many are invited. That's the Greek word for called. It means many are invited. A few are chosen. You know what that means? Elected. Few are specifically favored. John the Baptist was one. John the Baptist could not do anything different than he did. Why? Because he was prophesied in the scriptures. Let's say that he didn't do what he did. He went out and became a drunk instead. Were those verses about John being the front runner before Christ going to disappear from the Bible? You know, I, I've read books. I remember when I was in prison, there was a book about Kissinger. Kissinger was the Antichrist, 666. And then there was other groups that were going to kill the Antichrist. Well, what are you going to do? When you kill the Antichrist, is those scriptures going to disappear from the book of Revelation? No. I don't know at all, but I know one thing. He does. He has all knowledge. And what he does with our lives, the thing that he brings us into, what God's going to do with you too, is going to be the best thing that ever happened. You feel that way? Come on, admit it. He said to me, when I came, you going to bring the fire today? I said, oh, so. <laughs> oh, man. God is so good to us. God is so good. And we love him because of it. But guess what? We love him because he first loved us. Thank you, Jesus. God sent people to help me. God sent John and Chris to help me. God sent Steve and Jerry to help me. God sent Bob. God sent many of you to help me. I got out of prison. I've told this story before, but for the new folks, you don't know it. All I had was a borrowed pair of shoes that my sister gave me. This is back in 1976 with them long wooden heels. And she had a pair of Vanderbilt jeans, girls' jeans. I took them to the heels and sawed them off with a handsaw. When Donna just got music and that, you want to hire me? And he did. We're still friends today. Every time I see John and Chris up here on this stage, I remember 35 years ago when we started this church, I was one of the, you know, we had just closed our coffee house. We were getting ready to move to Hong Kong. And I remember the days, but they're still here. And they're still doing it. And they still got the anointing on them. Look at their kids and their grandkids. Man, they're going to live to be enough to have six generations up there. <laughs> sitting in the play hall. Why? Because look at their kids. They honor their father and their mother. And they did the same thing. John's mother was one of the holiest women I ever met. When she was past where anybody would expect anything of her, she went back to Ohio and started a garden. Was it Ohio? Illinois. Started a garden in the city to feed the poor. She was how old then? 76, 77? What a wonderful lady. I still remember her. God is so good. Well, I'm done here. But I want to ask you before I leave. Are you mad at me? No. How many of you would say, I hear that. God's called me to be a servant. I'm ready to be whatever God wants me to be. Yes. 
And this is a new girl. Thank God for that. Who else? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, honey. I'll point you out in the crowd. It's my nature. <laughs> Anybody else would say, hey, okay, I have, I've been kind of slack. I've been watered down a little bit. The things of this world. I mean, this last year and a half, if it doesn't make you leery, you're tough stuff. We're living in crazy times, aren't we? When goodness is called evil, and evil is called goodness. So, but God knows the difference. He knows who are his. Jesus said, none of them will slip out of my Father's hands. He knows who they are. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Why? For I am meek and, whole, and lone, uh, lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Man, thank you, God, that we've got rest. Anybody in here say, I need a little bit more. I've got to slip back. Don't be afraid. Lift your hand. I want to pray for you if it's you. If you haven't, okay, good. If you haven't, then I expect you to meet me outside right after we're going to go down and witness in the streets. Who's coming? Oh, everybody's hand going down. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for new covenant. I thank you for what you're doing here. I see new life coming in, Father. I hear things that are happening with the young people. I just thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. They've committed this church to you, and you will bring it to the place you want it to be. All the new things that are happening here are your things, Lord. They're because of you. And I thank you, Lord. Bless those who've served here for Lord, so long, Lord who've been faithful here, Lord. I think about Bob. He's finally stepping back and taking a little break. Who knows how long that'll last. And I'm going to drag him out of the closet and put him up here again. But in the meantime, Lord, bless him and Jenny, Lord. Bless all of them here that are serving you. We give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name. 